Welcome, everybody. Today, we are so glad you're joining us for our webinar. Uh, we're going to give everybody just a few minutes to jump on in here and get into the room. But today, we are talking about how economic trends are shaping donor behavior. Uh, it's a look at, um, at what you can likely expect in 2024 based on what's happening in the economy, what's happening uh, with, with political trends. Um, and we're really excited to partner with Dunham & Company on this webinar. Dunham & Company does research around this topic every year. So again, we just want to give people a few minutes just to uh, start coming on in here. We know it takes a second for Zoom to let everybody in, and then we will get started. We'd love to know where you're joining us from. If you want to drop that in the chat, we'd love to see what parts of the country people are joining us from uh, on this afternoon or, or, or morning, depending on where you are. Um, I want to go ahead and introduce Rick Dunham. I know some of you that are joining this webinar have been working with Dunham & Company and already know Rick well. Some of you guys uh, have been working with SecureGive or, or, or some of you may not have worked with either of our companies before. But I'm really excited to introduce Rick Dunham. Rick is the founder and the chairman of Dunham & Company. Uh, he has spent over four decades leading in marketing and fundraising efforts within Christian nonprofits. So uh, that he may have been doing this longer than you've been alive. Um, so we're really excited to hear from his wisdom. He founded Dunham Company a little over 20 years ago. Um, and for several years now, they've been doing this annual donor confidence research. And it's been really insightful. And so I want to throw it over to Rick. And he's going to tell you more about that. And he's going to take us through what they have found through their latest 2024 update to this donor confidence research. Great. Thank you, Greg. And that made me feel really old, just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. That's okay. It's okay. Great to be with you all. So uh, let me let me share my screen so I can pull this up. So um, back, this goes back a number of years ago. We began to work with Campbell Rinker on uh, an annual donor confidence study. We really accelerated that during the pandemic because we we wanted to understand what in the world's going on with uh, donors especially during the pandemic when things were so awry. So um, this past January, we conducted our um, 2024 study. And um, for those that are want to nerd out on some of the details in terms of methodology, uh, this was a 15-minute online interview. It's a, it's a panel that we've been working on with Dynata for uh, years. And it basically, it, it requires people to double opt in and they have to have given at least $20 to charity in the past year. And as you can see, uh, the margin of error is three point, plus or minus 3.8% at the 95% confidence level. So um, coming into 24, if I kind of can back up just a moment, uh, back in 2022, when Giving USA releases data uh, mid 23, they reported a decline in giving for the first time uh, in decades. And it had been a, uh, well, actually it was since the great financial recession uh, that hit the, uh, in 2008 and 2009. And so obviously there was a lot of concern about what happened, in, what's happening in 23 and how does that imply, what are the implications for 2024? So the top line coming out of 2024 study is that there's this very interesting kind of this resilience by donors, uh, and they're showing some optimism coming into 2024. And I'm going to unpack that, uh, looking at kind of donor psyche, looking at uh, giving behavior, and also then how they're, what's their, kind of their economic out view, uh, outlook going into the future. So first of all, let's talk a little bit about donor psyche. In 2023, giving dropped pretty much across the board except for Gen X and silent generation. Uh, but as you can see, in particular, millennials dropped dramatically. So there was about a 43% decrease from 2020 to 2023 in giving by millennials. And it's significant because millennials had been showing different behavior uh, as you can see, in 2020 and in 2022, they outgave Gen X. But it, that flipped pretty dramatically in 2023. And uh, 
The boomer generation, you can see there's been a slow slide in their uh, overall giving per household, down about 16% since 2020. Silent generation, yes, they've they they've given the most of any generation, but they um, only make up five percent of the population. So their ability to impact overall philanthropy is pretty uh, small comparatively. Um, hey, Rick, yeah, question I have for you on that that um, yeah, you know, something we've talked about. Uh, and as I'm asking this question, one thing I want to mention to, to, to everybody joining us, uh, if you have questions, we want to be able to answer those as we go. We also want to be able to answer questions at the end. So just use that Q&A option at the bottom of your screen. Open that Q&A box, drop questions in there, and we'll be watching those and answer those as we go. But with this drop in millennials, something we've talked about in the past is millennials being kind of like the future powerhouse of giving for, for churches and nonprofits. Right. Um, so is there like kind of a red flag with millennials being no, I don't, distinctly dropped here? That's a really good question. I don't think so. I think it's more of a lifestyle, uh, life stage rather issue. Uh, when you think about millennials, they're early 40s, late 20s. So the youngest would be around 30-ish and the oldest would be about 42, 43. And when you look at that particular generation, they're right in the midst of uh, growing a family. So you've got all the expenses of raising kids, buying a home. You're not in your peak earning years yet. And any millennial that's out there right now with a family knows exactly what I'm talking about. It's like you you feel like you run out a month. Uh, you run out of money before you run out a month. So it's just it's I think it's more, uh, and you'll see it in some of the data. I think it's more the economy we've been in than anything else. Gotcha. That makes a lot of sense. And I, I fall in that millennial category, um, that, that age group. So I definitely yeah, understand what you're what you're saying. I think a lot of people joining probably fall in that age group as well, that child care expenses go up as the economy has taken a hit, as inflation's increased. Food exactly. Expenses and that's, have gone that's up. what we're actually going to see in the data is that the inflation has played a, a very significant role, I think, in impacting giving. So if we if we move on and uh, kind of on donor psyche, um, they, while the giving went down in 2023, with most generations what's interesting is that overall there and this is where i go back to that resilience that i talked about at the beginning the you, you can see that the percentage of donors saying they're going to give the same or more went up to nearly 80 percent it's the most since uh it at peaked and it's beyond what it was in 2022 and the percentage saying they're going to give less has gone down pretty dramatically from 2023. So there's this optimism that's beginning to be portrayed. The challenge, however, is that, and well, and part of this too, is that they're not facing as significant financial challenges as they were back in 2023. And again, you can see that in the data. i look at that middle line in particular. Households, donors are saying uh, their, their economic situation is somewhat to extremely challenging at 58%. That was up at 61% last year. And you can see that grew from 47% back in 2020 up to 61% last year. So you had this trajectory of increasing struggles financially. And again, Greg, that goes back to your question. I think that those increasing struggles financially really did impact giving. And the fact that that's beginning to wane slightly, to me, is a, a pretty big encouragement. The challenge, I think, the biggest challenge is with, again, millennials, to, to your point earlier, uh, Greg, is that notice that overall donors, that's the left-hand side, back in 2022, only 9% said they wouldn't give until the economy recovered. That went up to 16% in 23, and it stayed, it's within the margin of error. So it's pretty much the same as it was in 23 uh, and 24. And again, the giving being among the last expenses to go was at 15% in 22. That dropped to 11% last year, and it's at 10% this year overall. That's for donors in general. But when you look at millennials, back in 2022, again, only 9%, same as the general kind of donors, uh, only 9% said they wouldn't give again until uh, the economy recovered. That jumped all the way to 17% 
in 23, and now it's up to 22%. And notice that the giving being among the last things to go is down to 8% now. So you can see that the, the millennial generation in particular, and I pulled them out because they're the ones that showed this the most of any generation, they're really being impact, impacted by the economy. In fact, that's the next thing I wanted to show is that for those that say they're going to be giving less, I wanted to show you the last three years because what's really interesting, that orange part of the bar is inflation. And notice in 2022, it hadn't even showed up in previous years. Didn't, it didn't even register. And yet in 2022, it equaled personal financial situation as a reason for pulling back on giving. Um, and historically, the number one reason donors cite for not giving or for giving less is because of their personal financial situation. That might be buying a home, uh, unexpected expenses, got to replace a car. So stuff going on within their personal family budget that is causing them to pull back. But notice inflation just, it, it, it kind of came out of nowhere really in 22. It really decreased dramatically in 23. But notice in 24, it's starting to register again as uh, more significantly as a reason to give less. So I, I, and that's where I go back to, Greg, what you're asking about millennials. That's where this data says to me, the households being impacted most by this probably are millennials. Something that's really interesting to me about this is looking at the rise of the impact of personal financial situations on outlook of giving and what you were just showing a moment ago with um, millennials in particular showing um, this uh, increased likelihood that that giving won't be the last thing to go. Right. Um, and what that makes me think of is, is for church leaders uh, and for pastors in particular, a couple of things to, to be considering is how are you teaching on stewardship? How are you teaching on generosity? Um, are you in your church providing opportunities um, for people to learn how to biblically manage their finances? Obviously, there's nothing, you know, you can't snap your fingers and change the economy. You can't change what's happening in politics, um, you know, beyond going out and voting. Uh, but, but what we can do as church leaders is make sure that we're consistently teaching our, our congregants, our congregations, what it means to manage our resources um, in a way that honors God, what the Bible teaches us about that, how to manage debt, um, and and what it means to be a steward of all that God has given us. Uh, because a church, you know, charitable giving aside, giving to your church aside, it, it's a great way that I believe as a church we can help people, you know, really stand on that that biblical foundation um, and and see beyond what's happening in the economy, see beyond what's happening in politics. That's a really good word, Greg. And yeah, in fact, I had a, a conversation with a group yesterday uh, about that very thing, about our need to be um, willing to step forward and challenge God's people to fund God's work. Um, because as Jesus said in Matthew 6, wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart's going to be. And at the end of the day, God wants our heart, our whole heart, and our money's going to be related to that, what we do with it. Okay, so um, just to illustrate a bit more the impact of inflation, the blue line is inflation, red line is wage growth, and you can see starting in 21 that inflation took off like a rocket. We all felt it hit in spring of 22 its peak. And you can see how the lines cross here. So people, their wages just weren't keeping up with inflation. And that's why I think, again, when you think of kind of that life stage of where millennials are right now, you can know why, just look at the data and you can see why there's such a significant impact. And we're beginning to see that delta between wage growth and uh, CPI change, which is great. So, uh happened here sorry okay so uh, let's talk a little bit about giving behavior because there's some very interesting uh, things that we've discovered in the study about shifts in, in giving behavior first of all 
Online giving is continuing to grow in popularity with 65% of donors now saying they give this way compared to 59% a year ago. And we've just watched the slow growth of online giving. And it's really interesting because if you look at it by generation, it's the statement of the obvious is the younger the donor, the more likely they are to give online. And you can see this online giving by generation. And you can see in 2023, there's massive growth in online giving by Gen X, of Gen Z, uh, uh, some growth by millennials, and even growth by boomers up to 61% saying that they're now giving online. So I find it really interesting that we're continuing to see, and I think as as these donor generations begin to age that are more native to online giving, we're just going to see this trend continue. So that's super important because obviously making sure that the um, the facility for giving online is super easy, like Secure Give, then it that makes all the difference in the world. In fact, right now it's real. Go ahead, Greg. Someone's going to throw in there too, and I know this. I don't know if you're going to talk about this or not. But I know this was in the is in the full text of the study that we'll share with everybody after uh, after this webinar. But it also referenced the uh, the giving um, being done increasingly through mobile devices, yes. mobile web, not just desktop web, which is a really interesting thing and a really important thing um, for church leaders, for ministry leaders to keep in mind. If you look at the numbers. Um, for mobile web usage versus desktop web usage over the last several years. If you go back to, uh, I think, about 2020, uh, 2021, there was about 81% more peop- more traffic from mobile devices than from desktop uh, devices. So that would include laptops, computers, all that. Mm-hmm. Fast forward a few years now, there's 313% more traffic going to websites from mobile devices as compared to desktops, as compared to computers. So way, you know, huge, huge jump over the last three, four years in how people are using web. Interesting with that too, is those first few years, it's like more people are using mobile, but more people are also using, uh, we're also using um, desktop as well. So they're kind of climbing together, although mobile a little bit steeper over these last couple of years, mobile's continued to climb, but then desktop usage has continued to drop. The reason I say all this is because we're talking about the importance of, of online giving, the importance of having the right tools in place. I want to, you want to emphasize just for a moment, the importance of it being mobile friendly, mobile design, what we in, you know, development software development call a mobile first approach to yeah. your website, a mobile first approach to uh, your giving. So, I just want to mention those those numbers because I think those are pretty significant in terms of how people are likely going to interact with your website and how people are likely going to interact with your online giving environment. Yep. And I'll, we'll see some data that will help support that here in just a second. One of the things that I thought was really interesting is that um, if you go back and look at previous year's studies, uh, the number one reason people... Uh, one the number one thing people said they would like to see improved was making the giving form simpler or let fewer steps. And security was up there. But now if you look at the data, the number one issue is security. And uh, making it simpler has dropped pretty dramatically. So to me, that does a, says a couple things. And it's why I'm honestly not doing, I wasn't asked to do an ad for Secure Give, but this is why Secure Give is so important because you want to make sure that anybody giving an online gift, giving a gift to your church or organization, they have a sense that this is truly a secure transaction because they will abandon that process if they don't feel it is. Yeah, one, of, one of the things we've begun recommending to churches is even on your giving page on your website, including something just to reassure people of the security of it. It doesn't have to uh, be in depth, but if the people giving to your organization know that that is a priority to you, then they're going to trust the platforms that you have in place. And we'll share after this too, we've got some blog content, things about ways to audit the security of your church systems, ways, things to make sure you have in your giving provider for security. So we'll share that as well. But yeah, really want to encourage you include that on your giving page on your website, just so people know that is something that's a priority to your organization. Absolutely. So back to what you were talking about, smartphone usage. 
So giving via smartphone has jumped from 34% to 40% now. And obviously, the younger the generation, the more likely they are to give this way. Uh, but I, And we've watched this trend, Greg, just like you, that you're just seeing this massive increase in mobile usage. And if you're not mobile optimized, I mean, all of us have experienced it when we've clicked on a link and it's not mobile optimized and we're gone. It's just really super frustrating. And I think when you're talking about giving to one of the worst things for someone who's about to give to your organization, they can think to themselves is I'll do it later. Uh, because I'll do it later often turns into I'll do it never. Um, right. And so and you want to make sure that whether it's through their phone or, or in your church on a Sunday, that is always easy to give in that moment because we want them to be able to give now in the moment as they as they're you know making that decision they want to do that and not have to wait and think i'll do it later because we know how that often turns out yeah and, and i think uh amazon spoiled it for everybody because they've made the transaction so easy and that's what that's what the consumer now is expecting in any online transaction uh, giving by text hasn't really changed year over year. It's still about the same percentage, pretty small still. Although millennials, almost one out of 10 millennials say they, they've given by text. I see, I see this changing, uh, uh, just not yet as much as we would want it. What's really interesting is that uh, both email and social media have diminished uh, in terms of motivating an online gift. And I think this is really pretty fascinating. And I... Um, <laughs> Uh, having done this for more than four decades, I remember when the internet did not exist. And we used to often talk about basically the way that you contacted somebody was you used mail. And um, the your, your mailbox was just chocked full of, of mail every day. Well, that's not the experience today. Any of us go to our mailbox and we have two to three pieces, maybe, and it's usually junk mail. Uh, but your inbox is the old mailbox. And standing out in an inbox is becoming increasingly challenging. So I think that's why we're seeing the diminishment of, of email, in particular, driving uh, online giving. What's interesting, however, is that traditional direct mail continues to be an effective medium. Now, you know, as a church, you may say, well... We don't really use direct mail, and I would challenge why not. I think there's direct mail is a very effective way to keep congregants engaged uh, and even to begin to tell the stories of life change that are happening through the ministry of the church and obviously giving an opportunity to give. Because what, what's really interesting is that we see an increase in responsiveness to direct mail. And what we're, what we'll see is that the number one way donors prefer to give in the response to direct mail is online. So a lot of organizations and churches will even talk about, well, we won't put a you know a reply device. People one out of you know about uh, one out of four are still responding through the mail as their preference, but you have one out of two saying their preference is to give online. And what we're seeing generally is that. Um, We've actually done some studies on this, and uh, it's not unusual to see 50% more revenue come online than what's what, what actually traceable through the mail. And my point in all this is people, uh, stimulating people to engage in their giving behavior, use all channels. Use all channels, because that's the way uh, to have, be most effective. So finally, uh, just talk a little bit about the what do donors feel about their economic view going forward? Uh, I want to spend a little time on this because it's pretty important. Back in 2021, 26% of donors thought uh, the economy would decline in the coming 12 months. 30% said it'd stay the same, 33%. So uh, a plurality said it would improve, and 10% were unsure. The decline grew to 46% in 2022 and staying the same. So the plurality shifted from improved to, to decline and it stayed there in 2023. And now it's beginning to normalize a little bit and coming back down, we're only 35% are saying it's going to decline. So that's a pretty significant shift from 2022. 
with uh, 32% saying it's going to stay the same and improve, and only 24% now saying it's going to improve. All that, again, goes back to this kind of resilience of what donors feel, but they're realistic. And what I find interesting here is that the realism is playing out in, in that 42% of donors now are saying it's going to take at least 12 to 24 months for the economy to, to improve. Back when inflation was super hot, you could see that 54% said it was going to take more than 24 months to improve. So again, slight improvement um, in terms of how donors are viewing the economy, but they still are pretty realistic in, ter in terms of of what it's going to take or how long it's going to take to actually improve. So if I could just kind of summarize what I think the key takeaways are, first of all, overall donors are showing a strong intent to give this year as they face less financial pressure. So the pressure is still there. It's just, it's, it's uh, gone down a slightly for most households. However, the drop in donor support last year among millennials is likely to continue in 2024. That's just, a, I just think that's a reality that we're facing. Online giving continues to uh, to grow as a preferred way to make a donation. However, donors are most secure, most concerned now about security. So, uh, like Greg said, I would I would do some I would do whatever you can to help uh, an individual feel like their transaction is secure with you. Nearly nine out of ten donors say they respond to direct mail, and the preferred way to give is online. Uh, so, online is going to increase in terms of the way people give. Email is diminishing and stimulating the gifts. So just a word of caution there, just it's more challenging to uh, motivate individual donors to give that way. Giving by smartphone is growing, especially among younger donors. And overall, donors are a bit more optimistic about the economy. However, they are realistic about how long it will take to recover. So I'll leave it at that and happy to take whatever questions. So uh, as we um... Uh, as we kind of close out here and answer some questions, one thing I want to I would like to start with, and again, as we're talking, still continue uh, to feel free to answer uh, or to sorry to drop questions in that Q and A panel so at the bottom of your screen, um, and we'll answer those as we go. I know some have already been answered, um, but uh, one one question I'd have, uh, Rick, that I'd love for you to speak into is um, any other specific things that from your your perspective, from what you guys do at Dunham & Company, that churches need to be very intentional about uh, in this season to um, either retain givers, engage new givers? Yeah. So, and I'm, what I'm about to say is not news to anybody. I know post-COVID, it's been a very different environment. And our studies continue to show um, a mixture of people attending online and attending in person. And um, I would say more than ever, uh, a couple things. First, take responsibility to keep congregants engaged. And what I mean by that, uh, one study uh, that I heard of a week ago showed that the average attender is going to church every third week. So if that's true, then I've got to figure out throughout the month, how am I keeping my congregants engaged? And this is where I'm going back to both uh, email and direct mail, using both, using all channels, really, to keep congregants engaged and even give them opportunity to give. Secondly, making sure they hear the stories of life impact that the church is making possible through the variety of its ministries. Uh, that is... That is what motivates all of our studies show. The number one reason, regardless of the type of charity, regardless of whether it's local church, it's don Christian donors give because of mission. Mm -hmm. And think, the more I put that in front of them, the more likely I am to keep them engaged in giving. Yeah, and people, you know, in general, people look for, they, they want to be a part of something, right, that's making a difference, that's impacting the world in a positive way. And the more that you show people that through their giving, they're making this impact, they're a part of what the church is doing. They're not paying for somebody else to go do something. Through their giving, they are actively making an impact and, and making a difference in that. Yeah, it's absolutely right. We 
we a uh, number a few years ago, and we're actually redoing the study right now, did a study of listeners to Christian music radio. And um, one of the most fascinating things we discovered was that most of you would think, well, they if they support an, uh, a nonprofit radio network like a Way FM or uh, a Caleb or Air One, they do it because they want to make sure it's it's there for them. But actually, that's the opposite. The number one reason that donors, that listeners give to a Christian radio station is because they want to share the gospel, that they believe in the message. And my point in that is that even those types of charities where you would think people would have a different motivation to give, it isn't different. Believers want to see the gospel advanced. And the more I can demonstrate that's happening through my local church, the better off I am in keeping people engaged in giving. That's great. Uh, that's, that's a good word there. Um, I'll, so some, I want to answer a few of the questions coming in. One of the questions we were asked is uh, if QR codes are the most effective way to drive, quote, in worship giving. And um, I'll speak to this a little bit. And I'd love your thoughts on this as well. Something I, on our side, you know, what we see from Secure Give is, um, of course, you know, QR codes have been around for a long time and they never quite took off until COVID. And then, you know, now, QR codes skyrocketed and, they, and now they're kind of like a way of life. Um, and we've definitely seen value in leveraging QR codes uh, on screen, on the backs of seats. That's becoming increasingly popular. You can get QR code stickers that go on the back of a seat. Um, and that can link straight to your giving or that can link to like a, a landing page where someone can fill out their next steps card. Someone can give, someone can take different steps. But we, we've we seen so much value in it that we've actually gone into our software in and, and, and an update that's being released, released uh, I think it maybe was just released actually, or it's being released in the next week or two. Um, we're just went ahead and built a QR code generator right into our software. So when you have a specific cause, like um, you want to encourage people to donate to the Christmas offer or whatever, you can easily just have a QR code that you put right there up on your screen to make it really, really easy to engage in that way. So that's something we're definitely seeing. I know, Rick, you guys work with lots of churches on strategies, on fundraising, on campaigns. Is this something you guys typically recommend? Absolutely. And again, um, why wouldn't we give every opportunity for an individual to give? So a way to give. So if if I can just point my phone and, and make that gift real quickly, why wouldn't I do that? So yes, we absolutely <laughs> do recommend that. Um, yeah, and, and to underscore what you just said, making it easy to give for anybody, right, is kind of the one of the most important things. And so just, I think you have to evaluate who's in your church, the demographics of your church, and understand how different generations are more likely to give. Um, yeah, and, and boomer, just, boomers, just so you know, they hate you QR codes, they probably aren't going to use yeah. them. But the younger, the, gener the younger generations will, and that's, obviously, that's your future income. Yep. And that's where, and that's why like we've, you know, one of the things we always see a lot of churches find success with uh, is giving kiosks, um, you know, our kiosks accept Apple Pay and make it easy for that. But it's, it's like you're talking about the boomers that uh, are less likely to um, scan that QR code on screen, but are still a huge driver of, of how ministry and churches and nonprofit work is funded. Yep. Uh, so can't underestimate that. Um, Rick, someone was asking about the the data set for the survey. Uh, and I know you spoke a little bit about the setup of the survey and that kind of mm -hmm. thing at the beginning. But you can maybe want to speak to that a little bit. Sure. So Dynata, I work, we work with a research partner, Campbell Rinker. And since 2008, Dynata is a, it's a national firm that has developed the panel. So it's a national panel. It's a double opt-in. And... Uh, the data is um, once the once the uh, individual has completed the online survey, the research team goes back and cleans it to make sure that if we can tell when somebody has come into the panel that shouldn't be in there, so that person that's eliminated until we have the data set that we know is clean. So um, I don't know what other questions might be specifically, but I'm happy to answer those. Uh, and something I guess is good to to reference here is that it's, this is what you're how many years into doing this donor confidence research now? Well, the actual donor confidence index started in 2008. We've been a part of it for about 
eight years. Eight years. Um, and so one thing that's great is you've been able to look back and see what the research predicted and how that actually has played out over the last eight years and see that there's uh, a lot of viability to this research because you've been able to see what's predicted kind of come to fruition through that. Yeah. So and what's really interesting is that donors said last year <laughs> that they were more likely to pull back on giving. And that's exactly what happened. We saw that. And I'm, I'm anxious for other reports Fundraising Effectiveness Project, Giving USA to come out, looking at 2023 giving, because I think we're going to see them report the same thing. Um, we'll, we'll wrap up here in just a couple of minutes. Uh, a couple things I'll touch on real quick. Again, if you have any more final questions, drop them in there, and we'll answer those as well before we uh, get out of here. But uh, a couple of things I mentioned. So uh, like Rick mentioned earlier, so Dunham & Company has, they do lots of different research. Um, they have some new things coming down the pipeline. We're partnering with Dunham & Company on some upcoming research that we're excited to share with you, hopefully uh, probably later this year, diving into some of what's happening with capital campaigns. But uh, what I want to uh, get get you to, to give some info on, Rick, is if people want to stay up to date on what's happening with the research, what you guys are doing Dunham & Company, what is the best way for them to connect with you guys to do that? Sure. They, anybody can go to DunhamAndCompany.com. It's all spelled out. And uh, when you go to the homepage, you'll see uh, our uh, uh, there is a, a navigation where you can go to our research page and you can download. We've got all sorts of projects we've done over the years that you can download uh, there at no cost. That's great. I also encourage you while you're there to check out their blog. They've got lots of great blog content, a lot of great stuff um, that's that's beneficial for churches and nonprofits alike. Um, so definitely uh, check that out. And I can tell you, you know, we Dunham & Company is, is an organization that we uh, we work with closely. Um, they are, uh, they're the real deal. Um, they love the church. They are invested in furthering uh, the reach of the gospel. Um, and so I definitely encourage you, if you have never connected with them, know that they are a great organization uh, to connect with. I also want to let you know if you want to connect with our team at Secure Give. We would absolutely love uh, to be able to connect with you. Um, we talked about um, some of the, the the ways technologies are, are crucial in engaging these different generations of givers. Uh, and we would love to help your church walk through that. We'd love even just to answer any questions you have uh, about that. So, um, you know, just go to just send us an email, grow at securegive.com. That's all you got to do, just grow at securegive.com. You can also go to our website, securegive.com. Um, but just shoot us an email and our team would love to connect with you. Also on our website, we've got um, resources and things we'd love to share with you. In our email follow-up, obviously from this webinar with an email, we're going to share the recording. Uh, we're going to share a full copy of the donor confidence study um, that Rick just walked us through the findings of and gave his extra insights to. Um, but we'll also share some other additional resource links as well from the security team, from the Dunham & Company team. Um, and uh, if you have any questions, you want to follow back up with us, absolutely. Um, you can feel free to follow via that email. I just know that, that both of our teams would love to serve your church, to help your church. Um, not just, you know, try to scratch your way through uh, th this kind of continuing economic turmoil inflation, and inflation, um, but to really have a sound strategy in place. Uh, and also just to remind you that, um, that this research is showing a lot of hope, that uh, that that we are, are seeing things start to turn. But also along with that, no matter what the research shows, man, we fully believe that nothing about politics, nothing about the economy is going to slow down what God is going to do in your church. Uh, and so we fully believe that. Um, thank you guys so much for joining us today. Rick, thank you so much thank for you. being a part of this webinar. Thank you for giving us your years of wisdom and insight. We really appreciate it. And uh, thank you guys for joining. And I hope you have a great rest of your day, great week.